for glycolysis to occur. Mostly over here. It's kind of quiet back here. Nobody wants it. What's one thing we need for glycolysis to occur? Glucose. Glucose. What else do we need for glycolysis to occur? <laughs> ATP. And what else do we need for glycolysis to occur? NAD+. NAD+. And that's the weakest link. If we have the right ingredients, what will we make? We will make ATP, NADH, and pyruvate. Now, here's a question that I didn't answer last time, but I, I might have, I don't remember. Does glycolysis require oxygen? No. No. However, what is the weakest link in glycolysis? What's the limiting factor? NAD plus. Absolutely, NAD plus. All right, so here we have it. You start with glucose. The first half of glycolysis is the investment phase, right? We put two ATPs in. So we're already in, in the red for two. We, we're, we're, lo we're loaning two, we're borrowing two. We make up four down here, we get back four, and we also get back two NADHs and we wind up with pyruvate. Now, pyruvate is actually two pyruvates, right? It's two three carbon molecules. So from this point on, it's like dealing with twins, right? Have you ever had to deal with twins? You have to buy two of everything. Matching clothes, you have, tw you have twins? So you know what I'm talking about, right? You get one for one, you gotta get exactly the same thing for the other. I think until I get like 13, and then they're like, no, absolutely not. Huh? Now? Oh, it's seven. Okay, they're getting a little earlier. My friends had identical twin girls. So at this point, what I mean, what I mean by that is, everything we do from this point on, you have to do twice. Simply put, what if I put one ATP, I mean two. If I say three NADHs, I mean six. Right? Because everything is double. If I say one cycle of the uh, citric acid cycle, I mean two. Just because. Each time through is one molecule, and since we've got two, we do it twice, all right? Now, this is sort of the picture that I had up here before, right? With one exception. It didn't have this in there. This is the transition step. This is the next step, all right? We go from pyruvate that's in the cytoplasm, but we've got to, if we're going to continue, we've got to get into the mitochondria. And again, remember, that's a, that's a uh, membrane we have to get across. And that's not easy, is it? Particularly for a molecule like pyruvate that's got a charge on it. So what do we do? We go through a carrier molecule, and it looks like this. Okay, so we go from the cytosol, but there's some interesting things going on here. First of all, we lose a carbon. So, for keeping score, We got one CO2 produced. All right, that's for one molecule of pyruvate, which means we wind up with just this part of the molecule left over, right? It's a CO, CO, uh, COCH3. That's called an acetyl group, all right? It's a carbonyl and a, and a uh, methyl group. Now, when this goes through, it's a redox reaction, so we actually will reduce NADH. And folks, right there is one of them that we often forget. When you start adding up the totals, we forget that we make that one. All right? Now, this right here is not COO, is not CO2. If we cut that off right there, we wind up producing a waste of CO2. But then this acetyl group is picked up by this coenzyme A. So Coenzyme A is basically a complex molecule that likes carrying little packets of carbon. That's what its job is. It's going to show up and leave and show up and leave and show up and leave. But it's there to carry around that little extra piece. All right? So we're going to see, and we don't even have to bother. It's kind of, it's like an enzyme, right? Enzymes don't change. Neither does CoA. 
So right now we're gonna call it acetyl-CoA, and in the next step then we're gonna see how the CoA simply transfers that carbon and then leaves. And then it shows up again and then leaves and so on and so on. So, <clears throat> let's, keep, let's take a running tally here then. Um, for glycolysis, oh wait a minute. All right, so, so far, ATP in glycolysis. How many ATPs did we make from glycolysis? Two. How many NADHs? Two. Two. How many FADH2s? Zero so far, good question, sorry. All right, now, in the transition step, Here's a trick question. How many ATPs? Zero. How many NADHs? Two. two. Why two? So it happens two. twice. It happens twice. It's everything up, up there times two. So, two. How many FADH2? All right, so far so good. At this point, we have still only two ATPs. But where, where are we now? We now have made... Oops, sorry. Two CO2s. We just check marks there. We've made a total of four NADHs, and you know those are worth something if we can spend them later, right? If we can cash them. But we haven't gotten that far yet. All right, so we still only have two ATPs, but we are inside the mitochondria. And that's the, that's the trick. We're inside the mitochondria, and we now have a, an acetyl-CoA functional unit to begin the citric acid cycle. All right, we're in the right place. All right, the citric acid cycle, here's the dossier, right? Where does it occur? In the matrix. All right, so don't forget, here's the internal membrane, which actually is folded, right? Here's the outer membrane. So, if I, all right. Not a good drawing of it, but we'll keep it simple. So this is the matrix. This is the intermembrane space. The enzymes are right here. Actually, the enzymes for the citric acid cycle are in the matrix itself, all right? So what is it? It's a multi-step, man, forget this for now. We'll come back to that. But we're in the matrix. We're in this area here. Anyway, it's a multi-step cyclical pathway. And again, anytime you have a cyclical pathway, it can't be perpetual, right? Normally what you do is you add something to it and eventually lose it coming back to your starting point. In this case, what are we adding? We're adding acetyl-CoA. But in essence, what really? Are we adding the CoA part? No, we're just adding the acetyl. And as far as I'm concerned, what is an acetyl? Two carbons. All right. So we add two carbons. Our starting molecule is oxaloacetate, which is four carbons. So we add two carbons, four carbons, wind up with six carbons, and it's called citric acid. That's where the name comes from. And this is what we're going to end up producing per cycle. All right. So let's take a look. This is actually kind of a pretty picture. I thought I'd add this one. It's loud, but what it shows you is the number of reactions. And it shows you the size of the molecule. It starts off with six and six and six and five and five and four and four and four and four and four. And everywhere there's a blue star is a redox reaction. Everywhere there's a yellow star is the um, phosphorylation of an ATP. So there's a lot of stuff going on. This is, pretty, this is a loud process. But remember, do we need to know every step? All right, so here's the transition step into the citric acid cycle, of which we start with acetyl-CoA. So again, just like we did in glycolysis, let's go over the steps, but we won't have to memorize them, but it's just a way of understanding and getting appreciation for what is actually happening. Now, that first step, if I say what molecule do we start with in the citric acid cycle, I would say oxaloacetate, because we start and stop with that molecule, all right? Now, four carbons, 
plus the two in the acetyl group gives us six, in which case we form citrate or citric acid. And that's where the cycle's name comes from. It's the first product. All right, so far so good. Two plus four equals six. That's not our goal. The first reaction within the cycle itself, we go from citrate to isocitrate. It's just a real, it's just a modification, a reorganization of the molecule. Not too much excitement. We, we lose a molecule of water and we gain a molecule of water. Not a big deal. The second reaction is a redox, right? We go from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. And in the meantime, we reduce an NADH. So there's NADH number one. We go from alpha key to glue. Oh, and by the way, you notice we also lost a carbon. So now we're down to <coughs> five. Okay. We go from alpha key to glutarate to succinyl CoA. Oh, by the way, there's a CoA again. CoA has come back into the picture. We lose a second carbon. We also reduce another molecule of NADH. So now we're down to four carbons. All right. We're down to four carbons. And by the way, if you happen to notice, it's the carbons we lost were not from the original molecule. So every time we keep recycling different carbons. What is CoA again? CoA is just a, it's a coenzyme that carries um, carbon-containing groups around this re reaction. CoA shows up in a number of different places in biological reactions. In fact, we, we, it's very rare that you even see what CoA looks like because it's almost like an enzyme. It doesn't really change. It just binds and it carries and then it's released kind of thing. All right, so there's succinyl. From this point on now, we're just rearranging the molecule. Succinyl to CoA to succinate. Again, we lose the CoA again. But in this case, what we do is we will be phosphorylating a GTP rather than an ATP. But because GTP has the same energy as an ATP, we'll make one of them later. So in essence, what did we just do? We just made an ATP. So succinate goes to fumarate. Fumarate is a reduction step. So we reduce FADH2. FADH2 is the a cousin to NADH. Just has a little less energy in it. Fumarate to malate. Malate to oxaloacetate. And we finally have another reduction step. Each one of those is siphoning off just a little bit more of the energy that's in there, just a little bit more. By rearranging those bonds, we take a little more and a little more and a little more energy out. So by the time we're done, we've taken enough energy to release to reduce one, two, three NADHs, one ATP, and one FADH2. Are those our actual numbers? Times two, right? Because we started with two molecules of acetyl CoA. So, how many ATP? Oh, that's uh, citric acid cycle. How many ATPs? Two. How many NADHs? Six. Six. How many FADH2s? Two. two. It's a 1 3 1 or a 2 6 2 situation. Yes? Is carbon dioxide not a product? It's a waste product. There's one here and one there. We're only looking at the, the, the useful side of things. So, in fact, we lose two in the transition step. So when we first start off, there are six carbons, right? We lose two of them in the transition step, and we lose two more in each cycle of the, the citric acid cycle. So by the time we're done, we have completely oxidized glucose down to CO2 and water at this stage. And CO2 is so low, it's so oxidized that there's really no energy left. So we simply give it off as waste. So in glycosis, we're, are we actually netting two ATP? Yes. So we, we use two and get four? Gain four, yes. Okay. So as far as the bottom line is concerned, it's like an accounting. If you owe five and gain ten, you come out five ahead. All right? So what are our totals? Our totals are four ATPs, 10 NADHs, and two FADH2s.
and we're done, right? Because everything that we brought in, all the carbon has all been converted to CO2. It's all a waste. It's all back in the bloodstream, heading back to the lungs, and we're good to go. Or are we? Pump, huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. Far from it. No, what we've done so far is we've converted all the energy to another form, but we can't use that, can we? We can only use actually the four ATPs. What we're going to do next is we're going to cash those checks. And those checks are the NADH and the FADH2s. So, there's our per cycle. So our results are just that's four ATPs, 10 NADHs, two FADH2s, but as I said, only the ATPs are useful. So somehow we have to get the energy back out of those other two molecules. And there's a lot, by the way. Right now we're looking at 34 ATPs still. So here's the electron transport pathway. This is the fourth stage, glycolysis, transition, citric acid cycle, and electron transport. Did you say NADHs are worth three ATPs? Yes. So if we can cash them, those 10 are worth each three, so that's 30 and 4, so that's about 34 ATPs. No. These are times three, these are times two. There's our 40, 34 extra for a total of 38. Okay? We're going to look at that next step right now. Now, getting back to my mitochondria here. Here's where they are. Now remember that inside is folded, right? But they're on the, they're on the, in, uh, the um, internal membrane, the, the, uh, in, the, the real folded membrane of the mitochondria. All right. Now, all these are enzymes. And these enzymes, their job is simply to take an electron or a pair of electrons and pass them on. But in the meantime, you siphon a little bit of energy off of it. Okay, just a little bit. Just enough to move one proton across that membrane. That's all you're doing. Okay? So, in comes NADH and becomes NAD plus but passes the electrons onto that first enzyme. Okay. <clears throat> now, I got a little bit of a, a little bit of an animation here that I put together. And it's actually kind of cute. Oops, wrong one. That's not it. It was the wrong one. It was. There it is. All right, here we go. Now, <clears throat> keep an eye on this. Remember, above is the intermembrane space right here. Below is the matrix. So right now, the NADH is in the matrix. All right? So that, that NADH is going to give up a pair of electrons and become NAD+. It's also going to give up hydrogen ions, right? Because isn't there a hydrogen ion attached? So every time it loses its electrons, it's also going to increase the number of protons in the matrix. And what happens when you have protons all bunched up like that? They want to disperse by diffusion. All right, so what do we do with this NAD plus? That's the NAD plus that goes back to glycolysis. That's the NAD plus that goes back to the transition step. It goes back to the citric acid cycle. Anywhere we have reduction oxidation steps, we need that NAD+. That's where it comes from. That's, the, that's the, the solution to the weakest link. Okay? So, now watch. This, Hold on. Yes? This NAD+, came from one of the NADH that were produced in the first three steps? Yep. And they so all now, made it into the mitochondria. So now we're down to nine? No, we are we're sitting at ten. But one is being used up for the next? Yes. Now we're down to nine. I wasn't sure where you're going with that one, but you're right, yes. Okay. So we go through this process 10 times. All right, so 
those electrons go to the first, con uh, first enzyme complex and it's enough to pump one proton out. Where is that going? Right here. It gets passed to the second electron, or second complex, and we pump out a second proton. So now we've got another one. Oops. And it gets passed to the third one, and we pump out, actually it's the fourth one, we skipped number two. But out goes the third proton. So what does that mean? For every pair of electrons, there's enough energy to add three protons to that proton gradient between the membranes. And by the way, don't forget that there's that outer membrane here. What do you suppose it's doing? <coughs> What's its job? So we'll have to keep the protons within the mitochondria? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a pen. We're keeping the protons close by. So instead, they would just sort of diffuse out into the cytoplasm, wouldn't they be useless? So now we're keeping them in there, and we're actually creating a, he a relatively good sized proton concentration right there. All right, now, I'm gonna blow your minds here, folks. Now? Seriously, huge. So you better sit down, strap on your seatbelt. What's one of the more, one of the most important elements re relative to all life? Carbon. Carbon, Carbon next is oxygen, right? Without oxygen, do we live? No, very important, huge. I mean, when oxygen is involved in a situation, there should be like lightning bolts and flashing neon signs, right? Oxygen, right? Big time, you know, like the signs that you wanna see always have neon on it, right? Oxygen has a pathetic job. Its job is to be the final, last in line acceptor for those electrons. So if this front row was our electron transport system. And let's say I was, an, I was an NADH, and I donate my electrons to enzyme number one. She passes them on, and passes them on, and passes them on, and passes them on. Guess who's sitting down here? Lowly oxygen. Not doing a lot, just sitting here. All of a sudden, he gets his pair of electrons and he goes, what do I do? Well, I'll give him the oxygen. Here. He gives them to me. I now have two extra electrons. What do two extra electrons normally attract? Protons. When a molecule of oxygen, well, I should say an atom of oxygen with two extra electrons attracts, what do we get? Water. Water. Ooh, flashing lights. You see it? Wasn't that exciting? <laughs> That's it. That's the job of oxygen. It's the final electron acceptor at the very end of the electron transport chain. Is that the only function of oxygen? Bingo. That and cause uh, oxidation of other chemicals, which is basically uh, toxin. So either they're bad or they do that. Just blew your mind, didn't I? You thought oxygen was so important. You're like, really? That's its job? Wow. I wanted to be oxygen when I grew up, right? <laughs> anyway, however, let's rephrase the situation. What if I'm not here? What does he do with his pair of electrons? He hangs on to them, which means he has to hang on to his, and she has to hang on to hers, and so on, 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 and then they're back to NADH. What can I do with my electrons? Nothing. Nothing. Do we regenerate any NAD plus? No. Do we have any NAD plus for the Krebs cycle, for the, tran the transition step, or for glycolysis? No. Do any of those function? No. All right, now I just blew your mind. Why not? Because without oxygen, NAD plus cannot be regenerated. And without NAD+, plus, none of those prior steps work. It can in glycolysis. It can, but without oxygen, there's something else. Fermentation. Fermentation, right. And we'll, we'll cover that on Wednesday, okay? But yeah, you are absolutely right. However, it, it does require that. It can't just keep going yeah. without regenerating it. All right, so let's get back to our storyline. So oxygen isn't as weenie as it seems. 
Okay, it does have a very significant purpose. It's the final electron acceptor for electrons in the electron transport chain, and without it, we cannot regenerate NAD plus for all those earlier reactions. All right, so what do we do now? Water goes away. We now have a gradient of protons in the inner membrane space. Now what? Just like anything else, if you have a if you have a concentration of ions in one place, what are they going, going to do? Disperse. Well, they're going to disperse in this space here, but they would rather go out here or go in here, right? Because there's none in either place, or at least less. So we have this other enzyme here. It's called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase really acts like a, literally, it acts like a water wheel. Every time one proton comes back through that water wheel, we make one ATP. There's enough energy stored up in one proton to make one ATP. So, here we have it. There goes the first one. There goes the second one. And there, well, and finally, here goes a third one. All right, go. And up, go. There you go. All right. And there's the third one. So we wind up making one ATP per proton for a total of three. So for every NADH, we totally make, totally, no, we actually, <laughs> I just said that one. Why did I say that? We make three, a total of three ATPs. Now, there's one other molecule we have to take care of, right? FADH2. The difference is it's a different molecule. So instead of starting here, we start here. And because we skip enzyme number one, it just means we're one short. So there goes the pair of electrons. There goes one. There goes the second pair of electrons. There goes proton number two. There's our new molecule of water. And I'm going fast here. There's our first proton going back through. There's ATP. There's our second proton going back through. And there's our second ATP. So that's the only difference. Because FADH2 starts at a little lower energy level, we are only able to make two ATPs from it. So, Thirty-eight. That's quite a bit, isn't it? That's a significant amount of ATP. Considering if we only use glycolysis, how many would we get? Two. Two. Now, there are many organisms that survive strictly on ATP alone. Sorry, just on glycolysis alone. The fermenters, the, not, the, the um, anaerobes, the anaerobic bacteria. In fact, you survive for short periods of time anaerobically. If you ever went for a sprint, it would only take about four seconds before your body would be in anaerobic mode. And you can only go approximately 10 seconds before you run out of steam if you're going full speed. You think about it, how fast can you run full speed before you wear out? I mean literally, as hard as you can run. Think about it, about 10 seconds, right? It's about the length of a 100 meter dash. Because any more than that and you're wearing down real fast. If you're running the 400, what do you have to do? Slow down. If you're running the 800, a little bit slower. Running the mile, a little bit slower, right? By the time you get that far, you're probably avoiding anaerobic behavior, but that's, that's for EMP. But anyway, so let's get back to where we were. Now, we call that aerobic respiration. It's aerobic because we have oxygen in the equation. Without oxygen, that whole process stops. Okay? Now, one thing I do want to mention. Sorry, does anybody have any questions at this point? Yes. <laughs> okay, so in glyco uh, glycosis? Glycolysis. Gly glycolysis, we've got two ATP being created in two right. NADH. Right. In the transition, we've got another two NADH, NADH being uh, created. And then in the citric acid cycle, we've got the, the big numbers. Uh, glycolysis is taking place in a cytosol. 
the transition is taking as place. As it enters into the mitochondria. As it enters through the mitochondria. Yeah. The CAC is taking place in the mitochondria. In the matrix. In the matrix of the mitochondria. And the electron transport system is on the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, but the ATP and NADH that we've already created have followed in? You're catching one of the flaws. Yes. Mm -hmm. It will actually get pumped in. Okay, so that that's come in with everything else, and then it it goes back into the the membrane membrane separating the internal uh, the matrix from. That's where the enzymes the are. That's where those enzymes are. Okay, but everything we've produced so far is going to go in, in that membrane. Other than these two, in. these two will be in the cytoplasm. They will stay there. Okay. But the NADH is going to follow in. I wouldn't say follow in. I would say getting pumped in, but yeah. Okay. And then all of it is it's going gonna, on inside the mitochondria. It's going to go through the membrane to, to become ATP. Mm -hmm. In a sense, yes. Okay. So if one of the NADHs goes back into doing the reaction again, wouldn't, wouldn't there actually be less ATP being generated, like three less than the 38? All of them are going back. Hold that thought. Yes, you're catching you're catching the flaw. There, it's not a flaw. It's a it's a it's an um and it's, it's an accounting error. But there's a un, if you ever heard there's an underlying cost. Yeah. What you just discovered, what you discovered, is one of the underlying costs. Why is it that what you said is a flaw? I'll tell you. Um. Now, first of all, let me just I'll get to that. But just let me point something out. How we just made all that ATP is called chemiosmosis or chemiosmotic phosphorylation. It's not the same way we made ATP in glycolysis or in the Krebs cycle, okay, citric acid cycle. That's called substrate level phosphorylation. All that is is you take an enzyme and then you take one molecule, you take the phosphate from ATP and you wind up in the, in the ADP and you make an ATP as, as a substrate of an enzyme. That's just an enzymatic reaction. It had nothing to do with concentration gradients and proton gradients and all that. Chemiosmotic phosphorylation requires that concentration gradient. So it's actually a little bit different, different way to make ATP, but the result is the same, all right? So basically we say that of those 38 possible, 34 are made by chemiosmosis or chemiosmotic phosphorylation and four are made by substrate level phosphorylation. All right, so that's just another view of it. And again, you pump the three out and they all come back through ATP synthase and ATP synthase is where we make the ATP. Okay, now, here's our, here's our, our yield, right? Two ATPs from glycolysis, two from the citric acid cycle, 32 to 34, and I say 32 to 34. That's where the numbers come in. The reason is, in order to move the NAD pluses, sorry, the NADHs from glycolysis into the mitochondria, we have to use active transport. So there is a cost, okay? There's a cost of two AT, there's one, one per molecule. That so we to, that we charged to a previous reaction. Well, yeah, it's kind of like just like in glycolysis, there was the two we started off with. In this case, if we spend two, we just take that off the bottom line. So we wind up making only thirty-six rather than thirty-eight because we actually spend two in the process. We spend two more. There is a cost. But in order for these two to come in, a previous reaction would have had to take place. Right. Right. Now you also have to remember they're not isolated. There, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, I'll answer, if I don't answer that question, you ask, ask me that again, okay? All right, so that's why I say approximate. And it's approximate because when you look at this table again, look at this, this is that same, this is, the, this is the minor version of that poster I showed you. You notice how they're not all isolated? There isn't a reaction right down the center that says glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1-6-bisphosphate, and so on. And that's because there are also intermediates in that process that can be used in other places. For instance, um, let's say you're building something and you, you get all your materials together. You're building a patio or something and then your, uh, your brother's helping out but your brother's putting in a sidewalk. 
and he comes and takes some of your material out to build a sidewalk. Can you build as much patio as you thought you were going to? No, that happens all the time. One of the intermediates, maybe it's a dihydroxyacetone phosphate, one of the first three carbon molecules, maybe it gets siphoned off to make some amino acid. The energy in that molecule can't go toward making ATP. Okay, yeah? Wouldn't it be more beneficial to the cell to always have that ATP being maximized and then have it? True, but what if you need something like an amino acid in a protein to be, I don't know, make ATP synthase? Where you and you're short that amino acid, maybe you need to make it. So again, remember, you are not just a linear process going from A to Z. You've got all these things all happening at once. You are simply the bottom line of all those reactions. So not only is there a cost to bringing in the NADHs into the mitochondria, there might be something else going on at the time as well. So really, a better way to look at it, instead of saying one glucose equals 38 ATP. That's the maximum. But in fact, what you might, what might be better off saying is 1,000 glucose should make 38,000 ATPs, right? But it probably is only in the range of 35,000. It's not totally efficient. We don't make the absolute maximum that we could something in the process is bound to be lost. That's all, okay? Something is bound to be lost because intermediates are sometimes siphoned off and also the two extra NADHs that are shuffled in end up not being able to make a full three ATPs because you spend one to get them in there in the first place. They make three, but there was a cost of one already, so they're already behind one, okay? Any question on that? So again, you've got to remember, it's not isolated. So, and oh, and by the way, just as we can lose things halfway, we can also gain things halfway. This is just a single source of fuel, right? One glucose. We can use other molecules for fuel. So let's take a look at this. What happens if we don't have glucose? Right? Can we use something else? Is there another sugar we mentioned in the, glycol the glycolytic pathway? Fructose. Fructose 6-phosphate, right? Because it goes glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. What if we already have fructose? Well, if we phosphorylate it, we get fructose 1-phosphate. That's not the right one. And then we shift that phosphate over to 6. It's an extra step, but we can now use fructose instead of using glucose. Galactose can be converted to glucose first and then enters the glycolytic pathway. Some other sugars can enter anywhere as an intermediate here. You know, this isn't the only place where we come across fructose 1,6-bisphosphate or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or, you know, phosphoenopyruvate. If we have those, they can enter the glycolytic pathway as an intermediate. So again, that would throw off our bottom line, right? We'd end up having more ATP than the glucose we started with. But that wouldn't necessarily be true, would it? How about proteins? Proteins are a bit more complex because proteins we first break down to amino acids. And if we start to use an amino acid, the first thing we will do is take off the amino group, which is basically an ammonia, right? Right here. So we take off that group. Now, the leftovers come in many different forms. Some can be converted directly to pyruvate. Some can be converted directly to acetyl-CoA. Some can be converted directly to intermediates in the citric acid cycle. Again, wherever you jump in, you simply accumulate energy from that point on. Okay? And then fatty acids, remember triisoglycerols, right? One glycerol, three fatty acids. The glycerol can be converted to glycerol to high 3 phosphate and jumps in right there. And fatty acids, this is actually kind of neat because this really plays, this really hits home. Remember, a fatty acid is a long hydrocarbon chain, right? Now, 
what you can do is if you cut that off right there, okay, what is this? It's carbon, carbon. And don't forget that the other end is a carbon is a uh, um, carboxyl unit, carbonyl and carboxyl. If you start lop lopping off two carbons at a time, you're going to get units that look somewhat similar to this. Actually, they're going to look a lot like an acetyl-CoA. So all you need to do is there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. I missed by one. But anyway, you cut off two at a time, and you actually cut and produce acetyl-CoA units. You, you produce acetyl units is what you, what you produce. So if you have something like palmitate, which is 16 carbons, that's eight, eight molecules of acetyl-CoA that you can produce. So what do you do? You simply take those eight units of acetyl-CoA, enter them at the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, find out how much ATP is produced from that point on, and you'll find out actually that per carbon, you can get more ATP out of fatty acids than you can out of sugar. That's one of the positives why we store up our energy as lipid instead of carbohydrate. It's also smaller. So volume-wise and pound-for-pound-wise, we have more energy storage in lipid than we have in sugar. So think about it. If we stored it up as fat, if we stored up our fuel as, as uh, carbohydrates, we really would be like a potato. We'd be much bigger than we are now. And some of us are much bigger than they should be anyway. So, but this just goes to show you that we can use alternative fuels. And by the way, do you know an organ that's very good at this? Your heart. Your heart is very good at using alternative fuel sources. Okay? Any other questions? So you gotta remember, we're, we're just, we're isolating these pathways, but none of them are isolated. They are all interacting with other reactions. And just remember, oh, yeah? This two carbon thing, how is that acetyl? It looks like ethyl. That one's not, the acetyl's at the other end. But I was just pointing that out because because um, at the other end, remember, you've got the, at this end, it would be carbonyl and a, a carboxyl, right? C. Um. But anyway, this, it's the, I'm trying to remember offhand right now, I can't remember. But the point is, in essence, things, which you stumped the professor. Anyway, um, as you cut off, just simply it's two carbon units from that end. I know what's confusing me is that um, that right there actually caused me nightmares. It's called an it's called an odd number amino. It's an odd number fatty acid. It takes an extra step to go from three carbons down to two. But anyway, um, that process it's just like slicing lo slices off a of loaf of bread. It's just two carbons, two carbons, two carbons. Each one is an acetyl group. Anyway, all right, so. It's not that specific. <laughs> I'm fast and loose with the formula, but that's in essence what's going on. All right, so anyway, just never forget, oxygen is absolutely necessary. Of these processes, how many of these processes occur if there's oxygen, if, without oxygen? Without oxygen, how much of this occurs? Just this. And the reason is, and we haven't gotten to this yet, the reason is, for everything else, you re you're required to have NAD+. Now, you do need NAD+, for glycolysis to occur. But for those organisms who do not use oxygen, they do what's called fermentation, okay? And I will get into more detail tomorrow, or on Wednesday, fermentation. But it's a, it, there's a simple outline looks like this. Glycolysis, right? Here's our black box. What goes in? Glucose. What comes out? Pyruvate. Right? In the meantime, we take NAD plus and reduce it to NADH. So far, so good. And also, Right? Two of them. 
two here, two here. All right, this shouldn't be too uh, profound. Now, the problem is if there's no oxygen, this comes to a screeching halt, doesn't it? We need to regenerate this molecule. This is the weakest link, right? Because without this, we always will have extra, we always have ATP everywhere, ADP. It's like walking through a cow pasture blindfolded. You're gonna step on it sooner or later, right? You're gonna come across ADPs just because we're always burning ATP all over the place. So this is always what's in short supply. So what we do is we take this molecule and in our situation, we take pyruvate and we take this energy here and we reduce pyruvate. We oxidize this back to NADH. We reduce pyruvate to, anyone know? Lactic acid. And for short periods of time, we can do that. We can go anaerobic. We will build up all kinds of lactic acid in the meantime, and that is part, not the entire reason, but that's part of what causes fatigue. No pain, no gain, feel the burn, right? Because you're building up lactic acid partially, not completely, and there's a lot of research going on about that right now. But that's how we go anaerobic. And we can only go for short periods of time because this becomes so strong that you can actually go into um, physiological paralysis where you have so much of this that your muscles stop functioning. However, what if we used, oh, I don't know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae? Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a little creature we like to call yeast. When yeast goes through this anaerobically, they take pyruvate and in one step convert it to acetaldehyde. Now, in the meantime, they produce a little molecule called CO2. Acetaldehyde is reduced in this fraction, and instead of lactic acid, ethanol. Or as my freshman by, uh, chem teacher said, booze, yep. You'd always come up with this reaction for somehow. But anyway, now if you put this all in a sealed container, what do you get? You get alcohol in bubbles. Champagne. <laughs> Hence, Dom Perignon was a monk in the early middle part of the Middle Ages in Europe. He invented that process, and that's how he invented champagne. And that's why they created it after him. Anyway, we will continue with this next time.